Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Mike Gardner, and uh, very excited to be doing this uh, proximal humor humorous webinar on behalf of the AO. We're going to be covering approaches, reduction strategies, and implants, or at least touch on these topics. Uh, clearly, a lot of information in about the next hour. I am glad to have um, on the panel tonight uh, two great surgeons and colleagues, Hobie Summers from Loyola in Chicago and Jonah Davies from Harborview at University of Washington. Uh, so just a few brief housekeeping things. Uh, AO North America is a nonprofit surgical subspecialty society uh, and not about promoting any, com any specific commercial products. So we're going to be talking about uh, some decision-making points, surgical execution, indications, augmentation. So kind of some of the, the baseline data, as well as uh, some more advanced level things for, uh, for kind of fellow level, uh, fellow level concepts. So overall, learning objectives are going to be understand the indications and principles of operative versus non-operative treatment, recognize some risk factors for fixation failure, and then we'll have one talk focusing on reduction as well as augmentation. So here's our agenda. We've got some kind of quick hitter, short talks, kind of bite-sized chunks, and we'll kind of keep the pace moving a little bit, try to touch on as much as, uh, as we can. And then again, when we get to the top of the hour in about an hour from now, we will uh, we'll, we'll go through some questions. We've got a number of other webinars coming up uh, through the AO. Here are the fellows, uh, fellow targeted ones, distal tibia, distal humerus, and pelvis, and then some more generic kind of all, uh, all audience webinars, geriatric ankle, periprosthetic, infection, and distal femur. So with that, we'll get right into it, and we'll start with uh, Hobie Summers. <clears throat> so, uh, these are my conflicts of interest. What I want you to learn, my learning objectives for uh, folks going into practice, uh, develop indications for operative and non-operative care of these fractures for your practice. Uh, this is something you have to kind of do, um, not necessarily on your own, but you have to kind of come up with an idea of what are my indications for surgery? Who do I treat non-operatively? So who should receive Open reduction internal fixation. So, you know, it requires a patient assessment, a fracture assessment. The patient and you both need to have goals and expectations. For example, hand on top of your head. I tell most folks with a proximal humerus fracture, if they can do what this young lady is doing in the picture after a proximal humerus fracture, I think they're going to be pretty happy. So I try to set good goals and expectations for these patients. Uh, so the patient assessment is critical. So their age, their physiologic age, their cognitive status, because we know there's some literature that the rehab potential on how pe people do after fixation of proximal humerus fractures does rely on their cog cognitive status um, and, and, and psychosocial issues. What is their activity level? What are their needs and expectations? And what is their bone quality like? It may be one thing to be able to get a reduction. Can you maintain that reduction with the bone quality that you have to work with? So high energy injuries in young patients, open fractures, fracture dislocations. In young patients with high energy, they're typically displaced, they're unstable patterns. These are high functioning individuals that have good bone quality. So for me, these patients, my goal is to restore anatomy and function, preserve their humeral head, really focus on their tuberosity position because I know that's important for their outcome. And when you think about placement of the plate and reducing the tuberosities, you wanna to try to avoid impingement and preserve their cuff function. For the elderly and low demand, these are extremely common osteoporotic fractures. Uh, there's complicating factors. So they typically have poor bone quality. We know that patients that begin early range of motion, uh, even if it's just um, uh, passive range of motion, pendulum exercises and therapy, earlier motion, typically they have better outcome. Uh, in the elderly, it's difficult to get a good reduction, maintain that reduction, and get a good functional outcome. So sometimes 
We do uh, things to try to maximize their function, alleviate pain, knowing that we may not you know, restore normal function for some of these folks. So for non-operative treatment, I would say for probably 75% of the elderly patients in my practice, whatever elderly means, a lot of them have minimally displaced fractures or they have really limited functional demands or they have very poor rehab potential or they're poor surgical candidates. These are the people that I guess I call seniors, not based on their age, but based on their physiologic overall well being. And non operative treatment, I think, is appropriate for a lot of those. What's the controversy about indications to begin with? I mean, what's the issue? I think the main issue is that there's a lot of literature against open reduction and trial fixation for low energy fractures. There are a lot of papers out there that show variable results with lock plating. There are some reports with complication rates of like 49%, almost 50%. So the controversy is why are we operating on a lot of these fractures if they don't have good results and they have high complication rates? What I would draw to your attention is that for a lot of the prior literature, the quality of the reduction has not historically been a focus when looking at some of these outcomes and looking at some of these complication rates. So I think we can potentially do better than we've done in the past. So operative indications, all displaced fractures in young, healthy people. The physiologically young and active seniors, I think, would be included in that group. Displaced and young are subjective terms, and it requires some judgment, and it determines your management. Some people, you know, a displaced, you know, what is a displaced greater tuberosity fracture? Is it five millimeters in an overhead athlete, but a centimeter and a half in a 90-year-old? I mean, your indications are really based on your patient and their needs. So I was trying to think about, are there any universal indications that I could perhaps uh, bestow upon our viewers. So for me, this is a varus pattern. It's not 100% displaced, but it doesn't have very good bony contact. I think the literature would support that this has a high non-union rate, and it also has a very poor prognosis in terms of function. So varus pattern, this is an older patient, but has pretty good bone. This is a fracture that we can reduce nicely. I think we can work very hard to get good medial cortical support and fix this well, even without any augmentation, and get a decent result, get this to heal. And that patient, I think, is without question better off with that fixed, no matter how old they are. So Vera's pattern would be one. This is another pattern that I kind of put in my universal indication group. This is a 60-year-old physician that works at your hospital. You've known this person for over 20 years, and they come to you with this fracture. And I would argue that this valgus impacted fracture does not have a lot of shaft translation. The tuberosities are not displaced. In my opinion, this is one that will almost universally heal and do pretty well with non-operative treatment. So valgus impaction without a significant head shaft, head shaft displacement and intact tuberosities, I think is another one you can kind of put in your universal basket of those that are gonna do well non-operatively. This is another one. This is a slightly varus, minimally displaced fracture to begin with, but the varus ones are the, some of the ones I think I would really keep an eye on because in just two weeks, it turns into this, the pull of the uh, 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 rotator cuff tendons just keep pulling this into varus. And this is where she is at two weeks. And then she heals in this position. She's not completely healed. She's kind of poorly healed. She's in varus and miserable. So I think these varus patterns that are varus from the very beginning have a high risk of displacing further and non-union. This one may be a little controversial. It's a 25 year old male. He's a healthy, active, athletic person. He has what some people would say is a minimally displaced uh, varus fracture. But if you calculate his head shaft angle, he's well below 140 degrees, which we know if they're greater than 140, they tend to heal pretty well. As the varus ones become more varus, they heal less well, and I think their function is not as good. So it may be controversial, but for me, this is an indication for surgery in a young, healthy person with a displaced varus, and it's a little bit angulated fracture, 
This is one that I would fix. This is an easy one to fix if you think about it. You can get good medial cortical support. He has good bone. You can give this patient an anatomic reduction and an opportunity to have really good function. So in short, my indications are a displaced fracture in a patient that I can obtain and maintain a good reduction that can also participate in rehab. They can physiologically tolerate a surgery and they have functional demands that I think are worthy of an operation. If I had universal truths to say, various patterns I think function poorly, they displace more frequently and they also have a higher rate of non-union. And I also think valgus impaction can be a reliable friend when you treat these non-operatively. I'll give awesome. it back to you, Michael. Thanks, Hobie. Appreciate it. All right. So we're going to build on that. And this will be actually kind of a, a prelude to the next two talks. And so we're going to start looking at predictors of failure. And so there are a number of reasons uh, why maintaining reduction and stable fixation proximal humerus fractures is difficult, but probably the most um, kind of contributory reason is this humeral head that we're trying to trying to hold on to with our typically metallic implants. So it's been likened to a rotten tomato, a tennis ball, or a rotten egg. This is a great analogy from one of my mentors, Dean Lorich, who put this together in our clinic one day, but and this is what we see, right? So locking screws are very rigid and stable. And we see this head often just melt off of these screws. So this is problematic. So here's a patient. This is like Kobe's last patient he just showed. 46-year-old male, kind of low transverse surgical neck fracture, a little bit of valgus. So this, I would say, when we treat with ORIF, we have a pretty reasonable margin for error. So the implant uh, placement and the reduction perfection probably won't lead this patient to have failure. Now we look at a patient like this. He's in varus now. He's got medial calcar comminution and he's osteoporotic. And so these patients are very different. And we might indicate these patients differently. We may treat these patients differently um, as far as all the adjuncts we use. And so it is important, I would contend, that we risk stratify and we're able to risk stratify based on our knowledge of the literature and personal experience, patients for implant failure. So when we look in the literature, what are some of the things that we see? Well, here's number one, kind of very broad, is that it's a theme that's pervasive in almost every paper that's come out about ORIF, approximate humerus fractures. And... The underlying theme is that without technical accuracy in general, we're going to have a high complication rate. And said another way, locking proximal humerus plates do not overcome a poorly executed plan or poorly executed surgery. Okay, so some specifics. Now, this look here on the left, this unsupported calcar comminution, turns out a lateral kind of tension band functioning plate with unicortical screws into the head does very poorly mechanically in offsetting these deforming forces. So this is a high risk situation. Osteoporosis everywhere in the body, but specific to proximal humerus fractures has also been demonstrated to be a high risk for failure. Initial varus pattern. So this is interesting. Also kind of a general orthopedic theme uh, but some specific studies have shown that the varus patterns occur less frequently, but are more difficult to reduce accurately, one, and are more difficult to maintain reduced, uh, number two. Here's just a few studies. This was an interesting patient. One of the earliest series of proximal humerus lock plating outcomes, JBJS 2008, series from Rochester, uh, New York. And in a subset of this paper, patients over 60 57% complication rate and 43% uh, screw cutout. Interesting. And so here's an example they chose to show in their paper. I don't think anybody would make the case that this is a, a well-reduced fracture, but maybe not surprisingly, this patient goes on to failure. Uh, another patient, also another study out of uh, this one out of Denver, uh, 153 patients when the neck shaft angle was less than 20, or 120, or in valgus, there was a there was a 
sorry, less than 120 or in Varus, 30% failure risk, greater than 120, more in Valgus, 11% failure. And interestingly, failure risk not associated with the number of screws. So the answer to overcoming poor reduction, et cetera, is also not add as many screws as you can. Finally, 70 patients, Southern California series, again, a little on the older side, 70 patients over 55 years old, 79%, these were all various patterns, 79% complication rate, double digit perfor screw perforation and reduction loss. Interestingly, they note, and this is what I alluded to before, 71% of these patients were malreduced. So it's kind of like buried in the discussion, but you know they allude to the fact that it's probably harder to get these patients well-reduced in the OR. Okay, and then malreduction. So these all kind of tie together, but malreduction is clearly in the surgeon's control. And this is a, is a clear predictive factor for failure. And so we don't want to leave the OR with a malreduced situation. Um, so what can we do to offset some of these? Well, it's not just the opposite of these, but anatomical reduction helps. And so here's a patient, and here's what we're looking at, calcar restitution, if it's comminuted. We still like to have this, quote, Shenton line reconstructed. And then next shaft angle, we want to make it look like a proximal humerus. Inframedial calcar screws seem to help. So these low inframedial screws seem to work. We uh, did a study on this a while ago now, looking at kind of medial support or not. And it turned out patients that had medial support in one of several ways, including inframedial calcar screws, had significantly less reduction loss. And so... Why does this happen? Well, there's weaker bones superiorly in the head. We were able to get longer screws centrally and inferiorly. We know generally longer implants are more stable. And so we think maybe it's kind of the old AO principle of a blade plate, where if we have a rotten tomato, we don't want to hold it from the top, but we want to support it with a broad-based implant or device at its base. Cement augmentation can help. This is a situation I use it most often in a, in a geriatric valgus pattern. We elevate the head and now we've got a big cancellous defect in the metaphysis here. So this is a good situation, I think, to fill this void, provide a stable platform for the head fragment. This is this patient, three months, head uh, uh, well reduced and healed and cement nearly fully resorbed. New fenestrated implants to, to deliver the cement into the head or on the horizon. And then finally, fibula strut allograft. Hobie's going to expand on this a little bit upcoming, but just to present the concept, I think the most useful situations to use a fibula, number one, most often is this terrible triad of osteoporosis, varus, calcar comminution, surgical neck non-unions, another great indication. And then when comminution extends distally into the metadiaphyseal region, it can be very helpful as well. Here's just an example of a younger patient, but varus calcar fragment. And this is the perfect situation where the calcar is actually reconstituted by a fibular allograft that you see here and ends up with a very stable construct. And that's it. Thanks. Next up, Jonah. All right. Thanks, Mike. Actually, that's going to work really well with our um, the next talk. It's almost like we planned it. Um, you know, I think one of the things, you know, we all do a lot of proximal humerus fractures and we think it's some of the hardest fractures to do, even despite, you know, a long time doing them and, and, and a lot of fellowships and whatnot. So I'll kind of go over some stuff because I think the number one thing to do is one, understand what you're looking at and two, figure out ways to, um, to get them reduced. So, uh, you know, what's normal, right? We Mike, Mike touched a little bit about it. Uh, the different things that we look at when we look at fractures are, you know, neck shaft angle or CCD the version, the sagittal plane, the tuberosity height, and then the calcar. And so when you're looking at these uh, normal anatomy, I think when you, we, we talk about CCD, Mike talked about it, but you know, if you look at a lot of different studies from arthroplasty or from fractures or from normal uh, bone, you have about 134 degrees is the average uh, with a range from 115 to 148. I'd, I'd probably argue 115 is quite low, but, but that's how it is. And most of the patients between 75 and 80% land somewhere between 130 and 140. And so uh, there is some some side to side difference. It's not exact uh, science, but I think if you're aiming somewhere around 135, you should be plus minus five degrees for most of these. What about version? You know, we look at these on the lateral oftentimes, and what we see is uh, that retroversion is anywhere from 
you know, 15 to 17 to all the way to 35, 40 degrees and up to 50 degrees if you're looking at uh, in some studies. And so how do you look at version? I, I kind of look at the lesser tuberosity pointing straight up a, a line down the shaft. And you can see if you were perfectly parallel, you'd be where that white dotted line is. And there's a little bit of retroversion because you have to externally rotate uh, to get the um, to get the, the tuberosity pointing directly up. And so here's about 10 degrees uh, of retroversion compared to that for probably a total somewhere around 20 to 25 degrees. Why does this matter? You know, when we look at complications, uh, uh, when these proximal humerus locking plates came out in the early 2000s, this is supposed to change the way that um, proximal humerus fractures were treated. And really, when you look at large series of, there, there's a lot of complications with these, AVN, non-union, fixation, fixation failure, revision. Um, so it's not just a implant related um, uh, surgery, right? We have to get them reduced. And as Hobie alluded to, a lot of these larger fracture uh, papers really don't quantify reduction. So it's difficult to kind of take it, um, uh, to figure out exactly what the, those are doing. But when you look at these, some of the studies that have actually looked at reduction, really what they're finding is that the reduction matters significantly. So uh, here's another paper out of, out of Baltimore that looked at a biomechanical study and really which type of deformity was least tolerated. And obviously varus is seen to be least tolerated most of the time. But interestingly enough, what they defined in this paper was a combined worse uh, uh, function when you combine varus with apex anterior deformity, which we'll see is a very common uh, deformity. And so um, when you have this by about 15 or 20 degrees uh, in two planes, it increases the joint forces and changes the cuff uh, pull significantly, which leads to decreased range of motion and increased wear at the joint. So if we're wondering why we have failures, this might be one of the reasons. Uh, the other studies that have looked at uh, malreduction really have found sort of guidelines, uh, basically that your neck shaft angle under 122, your grade tuberosity more than five millimeter displaced and a failure to restore that medial calcar, like you can see in this uh, image on the right and then secondary collapse. All of these lead to decreased uh, range of motion, decreased strength and increased pain and higher risk of revision. So it really does matter. The four categories that we look at, at least I do, is cor uh, coronal plane reduction, sagittal plane reduction, or, or and uh, this includes version, uh, the tuberosity reduction, and then also the calcar reduction. And my typical approach for these is to start with the coronal humeral head reduction. So I, either varus or valgus, take them out of that and put them back into a normal position. And then I'll correct the humeral head sagittal plane. I'll then uh, reduce the greater and lesser tuberosities. And obviously the coronal plane includes the calcar reduction as well. So when you're looking at a coronal plane, uh, there's a lot of different tools here. I'll kind of go through all of them. The, uh, the, the most common ones are probably shan spins and K wires. So you can see here, we have some K wires holding the head. And we're able to reduce them by elevating uh, the K-wire, manipulating them. Oftentimes, I'll put multiple K-wires or shan spins, at least two, to have two different planes uh, and be able to rotate and elevate in multiple planes at once, because these are often bi or even triplanar corrections. Uh, you can see the cob, which was used in uh, Mike's talk as well, uh, but you're here, the cob is elevating the humeral head. Um, you can use a bone tamp, so you'll see here, as you kind of tip the humeral head up, you can correct it until it's anatomic and then those wires are holding it uh, anteriorly. Use a shoulder hook or rotator cuff suture. So it's very important uh, if the rotator cuff is intact and is held to the humeral head, either through the subscapularis on the lesser tuberosity or through the um, greater tuberosity uh, that you, you can use that to help manipulate the head. Here's a bone hook or a shoulder hook that helps manipulate that as well. And you can see here, it's a significant varus in translation and we're able to bring it back into valgus and translate the over the humeral shaft. There's a plate assisted technique. So if you're very familiar with how your plate that system use, uh, it, that you use it works and how you can bring that in, you can see here, you're able to translate the shaft over uh, and restore normal neck shaft alignment. You can use laterally based clamps. So you can see here, uh, this is a non-union, but the principles apply the same. There's a significant amount of varus. So we're able to put a laterally based clamp while using the medial hinge to restore, plate it, and there it is nicely reduced and healed. So that's for coronal plane. If you also notice the medial calcar uh, uh, is reduced on this plane as well. When we're looking at a sagittal plane, I think this is something that is often missed uh, when we see patients for a second opinion or a redo uh, 
for a malunion or a, mal, uh, or a non-union, oftentimes the sagittal plane is off. And so you can see here's a sagittal view uh, of a um, humeral reduction. The wires are already in place, but you can clearly see that there's an apex anterior deformity, right? And so what we do to fix that is that we have to then bring the humerus out of uh, uh, apex anterior by forward elevating it and correcting that deformity. And you can see here now that's a nice straight line. And so typically, at least in my practice, how that's gone now is I, I do it with an arm positioner. So I have the arm in an arm positioner and forward elevate through that and are able to hold it up uh, in that way so that we can, um, we can get the, the correction that you just saw. The other things I look at are uh, translation, uh, which you can see here. If I draw, draw a plumb line down the humerus, we're sort of headed, uh, intersected with the anterior third of the humeral head. And uh, after correction here, you can see now we're sort of headed right down the, the middle. And so I, I know this is subtle, but once you get to see more and more of these, you're able to get that correction uh, better and better. And then retroversion is similar. So here's similar, uh, this is the same patient a little bit uh, earlier on. And you can see as we're uh, correcting here, we're in anaversion uh, with the, uh, the Shantzman going down the, the lesser tuberosity. And as I'm able to bring it out of uh, anaversion back into retroversion, I have about 10 degrees or 15 degrees of retroversion with regards to the uh, tuberosity. So probably about 20, 25 degrees of retroversion. Uh, so a lot of times the correction is comes after you can see my wires already in, I've backed them out and put them down. Finally, for the tuberosities, I think the, you know, the things that we want to avoid are these types of, of reductions where there's either escape or malreduction. And so, you know, typically it's great if there's a cortical read. So you can see on this patient, this is an isolated tuberosity fracture, but there's a nice cortical read where that red line is and that's where that goes. And so we can get that reduced and plated. And, and that's very easy to see that we have an anatomic reduction. Um, sometimes, the tuberosity just should lay flush with the humeral head. And sometimes it, it lays about one to two millimeters above or below, depending on the patient's anatomy. So contralateral sides can, can work well. But once you have them reduced, wire them in place. And you can see here, we have a nice reduction and it's wired. Uh, and really what you want to avoid is over reduction. And so then I, I'll use sutures every single time. Uh, this question comes up a lot, but I'm placing a uh, strong non-absorbable braided suture into the greater tuberosity at the bone tendon uh, junction with the rotator cuff. Same, same thing with the lesser tuberosity and reducing those back down uh, to the plate. And then obviously we know calcar reduction is very important. Uh, there's many different studies that have come out. This is a study that we did where we looked at the uh, reduction, how it was um, uh, necessary to prevent collapse. So you can see here, this is collapse in this one. And so the, you know, the, the, the tools for uh, reduction are the same. You just want to make sure that you're supporting them as was discussed earlier. And sometimes those calcars can look quite gnarly. Uh, but again, the idea is getting them reduced anatomically uh, with a, a variety of the various tools we talked about and then stabilizing them. And here you can see on the right, this patient's healed, uh, a fracture that surely should have collapsed or at least uh, gone on to AVN and is completely stable in the same position. So, um, that's where we're at with that. So take home message from me is that reduction, having the most reduction strategies is probably helpful because every case is a little bit different. Uh, you have to know what to look for so that you can reduce them adequately. I think when I was going through residency and even uh, later on, probably the eye uh, test doesn't uh, come as quick. And so it's important to really know what you're, you're looking for, know the normal anatomy, get contralateral x-rays if you need to. Make sure you have good imaging. We always get preoperative imaging before we prep and drape to make sure that we can see well um, and then have multiple of those strategies. The goal is to avoid something like this on the left so that I don't end up having to do a, a arthroplasty like this on the right. That's it. Learning objectives, describe when augmentation may be necessary, understand your augmentation options and then apply the correct technique when you're using augmentation. So, um, when it when augmentation may be necessary. So osteoporosis, it can lead to a, a big defect in the head with kind of a thin head fragment. I see this commonly with kind of this valgus impacted kind of crush type injury, where when you get it back reduced where it belongs out of valgus, you have this very large defect. Uh, also in the varus fracture pattern, uh, which can be associated with inadequate medial cortical support, or just those fractures that have a very comminuted medial column, and then also in non-union. So those are my primary reasons for augmentation. So 
what can you use for augmentation? I, I think about structural support. So I rarely, personally myself, I rarely use allograft uh, cancellous chips by themselves. You know, the humeral head, particularly in older people, you could just keep packing that in there. They don't have good bone to pack against sometimes. So I don't really use those very often. I think a calcium phosphate, you know, cement uh, bone void filler can work well, a fibular cortical strut, or in some cases you can use metal. So let's talk about osteoporosis and where you have a defect. So is this varus or valgus? I think, you know, looking at this image, I'm pretty sure that AP image is not really with the patient's arm in 20 to 30 degrees of external rotation. It's not really a great AP. Their arm is probably at their side or up against their abdomen. So it's difficult really to know what that is, but this is an osteoporotic fragment or fracture. Looking at the head segment, it looks like that might be kind of a little bit of a sliver of head when you look at the lateral. So this is a patient that's probably worthy of an operation that can do rehab. And when we get in the operating room, this is what it looks like in the operating room. So this is really a crushed head that's just been kind of impacted onto the shaft. So I know when I get this back out to length, if I can, we're gonna have a big defect here. So just working on getting it back out to length, as Jonas said, getting the medial aspect of the head and restoring this calcar, getting it back on the shaft. So hooray, we got it where we want it. We have some medial support, but then you have this huge defect. Wire this together. And for me, this is my, my uh, axillary view, making sure I don't have two apex anterior uh, uh, malreduction here. For me, this is a good one for a bone void filler like a calcium phosphate cement. So I would fill this with the calcium phosphate cement. I don't want the head to fall back onto the shaft and then fix it with a plate and screws. Because I have a pretty good medial sided reduction, I think it's going to really have a good opportunity to stay there either even in an older person with this big defect and in three months, no protruding screws, healing, doing well in therapy. So that's bone void filler, number one. So the varus pattern is another one. And uh, I'm gonna borrow some of these from Dr. Gardner because I don't do fibulas very often, but he certainly does. This is an elderly patient found down. This is a varus pattern, medial sided comminution. This is the disaster that nobody wants to take care of because these are difficult. So here's original fixation. You notice that they don't have an opportunity for good medial column support. There's just no bone there. And it's an initial varus pattern. It's gonna to want to keep falling back in varus. And this is a very good case for a bone void filler of some sort, because what happens is the rotator cuff simply keeps pulling on this fragment. It wants to go back into varus and there's nothing there medially, even if you have good medially placed calcar screws to hold it there. So this is a good argument for using something with these varus patterns. A fibular strut in this direction is probably the one that's most effective. If you can get it kind of shoved up into the head and get it pinned there so that it will keep the head from falling off into varus is your goal when using a fibular strut. So here's another one of Mike's cases. A varus pattern, there's gonna be some medial comminution. It's gonna be hard to get a good reduction of the head to the shaft medially. So first things first, get it out of varus. That's the first uh, step that Mike's doing here in this picture. And then starting to figure out, okay, what size of fibular strut do you need? Can I position it correctly? So typically with a K wire in the fragment, you can kind of go down inside here, get the fragment in and figure out, okay, how can I get this in here to support the head? This one's a little bit too long. He takes it out, he shortens it, gets it in a good position. So gets a good reduction, gets the allograft cortical strut from the fibula in a good position, and then wires it there. The, the graft is not just sitting there. That graft is pushing up against the head so that the head has something to push against. It's kind of replacing the calcar, although it looks like he's got it nicely reconstructed. He's giving that good support there so that this doesn't want to fall back into varus. This is kind of some clinical photos, a simple K wire in the, in the allografts can be very helpful to position it and then push it into the head so you can really get it up against the head to give it good support. Uh, fluoroscopic views, plate going on, 
And now you can see that you have a very well supported medial uh, cortex there to help prevent this from falling into varus. And that's the ideal way to position this for a varus pattern. This, if you notice, if you put the fibular strut in just lengthwise, and you put this really long strut in, you'll notice it's really not engaging that much of the head. This might be okay for a, a valgus pattern where you're trying to prevent it from falling back onto the screws. But for a varus pattern, this particular position of the graph would probably be not terribly helpful. So poor medial support is another one. And these are very difficult. Um, in Chicago, we have a lot of gunshot wounds that <laughs> come into our hospital. And this is a 50 year old gentleman that has this kind of complex proximal humerus fracture from gunshot wounds. So I know there's gonna be a big bone void. So in the operating room, on the right hand uh, picture, you can see there's this large kind of anterior cortical fragment that should probably be reduced first and try to reconstruct the shaft to see if there's something that I can set the head on. So let's start with that. So we get the shaft um, kind of clamped together and start maneuvering the head. I have a freer here uh, and I'm gonna try to lever the shaft in such a position that I can get it back underneath the head and see what kind of support I can get for this. I can get a little bit of bony support medially, but it's pretty comminuted over there. There's a large volume defect here from uh, this gunshot wound. And I ended up using, again, a calcium phosphate bone filler and actually got this in a pretty good position and tried to give this guy a chance to heal. This is immediately post-operatively. Here he is at two months. And at six months, I think I'm kind of losing the race. He's either not healed or his head's kind of collapsing and falling apart. Basic idea is I'm trying to fill that defect. I'm trying to get him healed. Certainly it looks like he's really tried to heal on the medial side, but I think I probably lost that one. Non-union can give you some kind of special situations. And uh, this is an interesting case that I did a few years ago that's actually proved to be pretty helpful to me. So this was a 47 year old female. This is her dominant arm. She had this injury 18 months ago. Notice she's in varus and she has this apex anterior deformity. And Jonah just talked to us about this. These are poor performers. These don't do well and they don't like to heal very well either. So she has pain with motion and lifting. She has difficulty with overhead activity. Her forward elevation is not that good. And she also has a psychiatric history. And so that's kind of why she's been kicked around for the last 18 months. Nobody really wants to do anything with this proximal humerus. So I look at it like this. She has a varus deformity. She also has apex anterior. She's going to have a medial deficiency once I correct this deformity. It depends on how you go about it. You could try to take the wedge of bone out and shorten her a little bit and give her less of a deficiency, or you could try to maintain her length and just correct her deformity. She has a little bit of area bridging laterally on the CT, but she's not very well healed. So I get images of her normal side for comparison and then start trying to execute my plan. So this is a case where I decided to use a metal medial cortical substitution. Uh, I know this has been done in the femur uh, for non-unions. I did it here because of her psychiatric history. It's a longstanding non-union. I want something really strong on the medial side that I think is reliably going to stay there and not collapse. So we correct her deformity, uh, get the plate in position, and then the screw from the proximal humerus locking plate goes through the screw hole in the other plate on the medial side to hold this here so that it won't collapse. Uh, getting three screws from through both plates is just pure luck. I'm not gonna take a lot of credit for that, but I actually got all three of them through there. Bone grafted this, and this here she is immediate post-operatively. And here she is about five months post-op, no pain, her motion's a lot better, and she's really done well. So that's an example of using um, metal as your uh, augmentation uh, device. Always take your non-injured site x-ray and lay it on top of your other and see if you really corrected their deformity the way you planned. So in summary, I think augmentation 
even if you can get a good reduction, meaning you restore your, your neck shaft angle, your head shaft angle, you restore your apex anterior, sometimes you need augmentation. So osteoporosis, when you have a big defect, you have a thin head fragment, you're gonna need some augmentation. Various fracture patterns, inadequate medial cortical support, and some of these longstanding non-unions, I think augmentation is gonna be paramount to being successful to fixing these. So for me, bone void filler, cement of some sort, a fibular strut, and metal are my go-tos for augmentation. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Hobie. So we'll get on now to surgical approaches <clears throat> to the proximal humerus. So the delta pectoral approach, clearly the workhorse to the shoulder, um, a lot of Things can be done around the shoulder. It's what everybody's trained on, traditional and familiar. Uh, but I would say, I think a lot of the uh, uh, steps and, and parts of treating a proximal humerus fracture with RIF is difficult through a delta pectoral approach. Um, so I'll show some of that and then uh, show the steps of an anterolateral acromial approach or deltoid split. So if you've done a proximal humerus RIF, which probably most of you have at this point in your career, you may have noticed that it can be very difficult. So this is a lateral plate, right? And there's lateral fracture pathology. And so to get around the deltoid, we often need to vigorously retract the deltoid. And again, the axillary nerve runs right underneath that deltoid, of course. And, and often we need to internally rotate the arm to expose the plating footprint. Um, and this often can shift our reduction when we have some provisional K wires that are often somewhat tenuous. Another problem with the delta pectoral approach, I'd say this is just a, um, a vascular injection study on an intact shoulder, showing us that one of the main, reminding us one of the main vascular supplies to the humeral head runs right on the anterior part of the proximal humerus, the ascending branch in the bicipital groove. So one of the hard things I think is accessing this greater tuberosity. It of course retracts posteriorly as well as proximally or superiorly. And so when we have this deltoid muscle mass, it can be hard to get around and access uh, the greater tuberosity fragment. So yeah, I've gone to this deltoid split approach for essentially every uh, type of proximal humerus fracture, not 100%, but the vast majority. I'm glad somebody asked about the positioning here, just a few slides on that. So reverse on a diving board table. Uh, we pull the patient over so the head is flush with the edge of the table. There's a plexiglass under the, the OR uh, cushion, and, and it has some padded blankets to support the arm. And then the, the bed rotates 90 degrees into the room and the C-arm comes in from the head. And so this way we're able to get orthogonal views without moving the patient. So here's a draped picture. This is actually how I do it now. I, Jonah mentioned this, but one of these pneumatic arm holders, I would say is extremely helpful for many aspects of this. Uh, but here you see again with the drapes on, C-arm comes in from the head. We tilt about 15 degrees to get a gracie view for the AP. And then the C-arm comes up and under, we get a good axillary. Usually we don't fully abduct the arm to get an axillary uh, because again, we've got kind of tenuous fixation, but we're able to get a very nice axillary. You've seen a bunch of, uh, of Jonah's and Hobie's. And so this is a good way to, it's very hard, I think, to, to use the scapular Y view only for things like sagittal plane, angulation, lesser tuberosity displacement and things. So it's a, it's a much nicer view to use, I think. Okay. So anterolateral acromial, I'll just a little bit posterior to the anterolateral corner of the acromion. Incision extends distally about 10 centimeters. I mark on the skin 65 millimeters from the acromion edge. And this is where that anterior motor branch of the axillary nerve is going to cross predictably. And so we get down through the sub-Q, the fascia comes quickly, even in larger arms. And sometimes we see a nice fat stripe between the anterior and the middle heads of the deltoid, what's been termed the raffe. So I took a picture, this is a nice example. It's not always this clear. This is from a cadaver, but usually I find that just palpation of the 
kind of interval or the defect between the anterior and the anterior mill heads gives the best landmark for where to start this split. So we want to start it proximal to where we know the nerve is and you see the nerve marked on the skin. So we know we're proximal. Once we get through our deltoid split, we get to the bursa and then we need to get through the bursa in order to get deep to the level of the axillary nerve, which we're going to need to get under later on in the procedure. So we'll then, then take the split proximally up to the acromion. I usually will remeasure with a ruler just to make sure my kind of palpable bony landmarks were accurate and then go from there. We tagged it over the vessel loop, 65 millimeters. Here's a picture of it skeletonized in a cadaver, just so you see what it looks like. You don't need to dissect it out like this. Essentially, in most cases, if a fracture fragment isn't impinging on the nerve, we just need to mobilize it to pass the plate underneath it. So here's an example of getting right down to the intertuberosity fracture line, which I think is a, a, a great advantage in using this approach. So now we have the leading ledge, leading edge of the lesser. We have the leading edge of the greater, and we can capture the rotator cuff insertions onto these fragments and mobilize them very easily. In this valgus pattern, we can then mobilize the head fragment as well. So that's mainly it for reduction. And then once the fracture is reduced, we slide the plate deep to the nerve. Uh, or the bundle of soft tissue around the nerve with very little tension. We put our screws proximally and distally. Now, these calcar screws we've been talking about, most implants, those screws are right under the nerve. So if we have a high-risk pattern and we want to prioritize those screws, we need to kind of move the nerve out of the way in order to put those screws in. And that's all. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, geriatric specifics, special considerations. And I think some of the questions that were asked earlier may be answered. So really, the question for me is, what, what do we do with this patient? This is a 64-year-old bus driver, she fell down the stairs, left shoulder pain, half, pack day per, uh, half a pack per day smoker, but nothing really other comorbidities, fairly active. And so, uh, you know, what do we do with this? What does the literature say? What, what should we do? So I think... The big reasons why geriatric proximal humerus fractures are different uh, have to do with these two main things. The first thing is uh, fracture fracture. So if we typically think that, you know, uh, this is an ice cream ball or a rotten tomato or a tennis ball, I think in, as the patients get older and older, these go from like a rotten tomato to like a, a composted tomato or desiccated tomato, right? So it's even worse. Uh, you know, these patients, even though they don't really have uh, bone loss because they're not open fractures. They have impaction and, and comminution that is essentially bone loss, right? They also have really thin fragments and uh, they're definitely a higher risk radian, right? So if we look at this, these, these patients, they also have medical comorbidities. They have baseline function. Can they be compliant, right? Older patients sometimes need to use walkers or need to use wheelchair or need help. And so, you know, we're going to do this big, important surgery. And then we're going to have them be in a sling for six weeks. It doesn't really help them. So we got to think about that as well. Uh, these are uh, from Australia, but there's similar numbers in the U.S. As you'll see, the number of cases for proximal humerus fractures is going up as the population ages and patients aren't dying uh, as young anymore. And so they're, they're falling and having this osteoporosis and getting these fractures. And the same thing can be seen in the States. Um, the one thing you'll notice here is the treatment has gone down for patients. Uh, with regards to uh, ORIF, it's now a much higher uh, rate of um, uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And then the biggest change of this is definitely in the 60 to 75 year old uh, patients. So what does it mean? These older patients, when they get these proximal humerus fractures, they're actually not like uh, hip fractures, right? They, they are a little bit older, uh, but they do live longer, right? They live, you know, uh, almost half of them are alive still at 20 years, which is much different compared to the hip fracture. So, so these patients need good function. Uh, and then we, we need to think of them sort of as a whole. Um, so we talked about poor bone quality. You can see here, you can barely see the difference between soft tissue and bone. This is going to be really challenging to obtain fixation, right? How do you manipulate the fragments? You put a shan spin in this and you start moving it, it's going to rip right through. Um, when I also think about these fractures, I look at the CT scan and, and uh, I look at the humeral head thickness. And I think, okay, even if I can get reduction, how do I maintain reduction? You can see here that thickness is very, uh, the, that, the humeral head piece is very thin and getting screws in that, you know, maybe you get two or three threads uh, into the piece at some places before they, they're in, in a subchondral. 
And you worry about that really holding on to the reduction, even if you're able to get it. Uh, the other thing you you know worry about is the poor bone, right? So here's a tuberosity that had stitches in it, but it tore right through the bone and uh, the patient had superior escape. And so this is something that you think about as well for these patients. What about compliance? I thought this is a patient of mine who went, uh, underwent a complicated surgery for non-union, but then was unable to not get up and move with her walker, has balance problems, fell and broke right below the plate. And so we see here that that's a, that can be an issue for that, right? What about AVN risk? This is a patient that had a fracture dislocation in a 70-year-old with four parts, and eventually the humeral shaft was reduced back into the, the joint leaving the humeral head and the axilla. And so it was fixed with the head on the back table basically being put back in and obviously went on to AVN and ultimately ended up with a reverse shoulder. Um, so I think, you know, when, when you're treating these, you got to think about the different solutions that we can offer, right? So one, treating or uh, choosing patients adequately for the right procedure. Some patients need non-operative management, some patients need operative fixation, and some need uh, arthroplasty. And so selecting the right patients for the right treatment is really where the the, the crux of the issue is. And then after that is if you are going to fix them, you have to think about adjunct fixation, which was already covered by Hobie mostly, but I'll, I'll maybe just talk about specifically in a, in a older patients, why uh, the ones that we, we tend to use more. So in these patients, it's just really unable to maintain that reduction whatsoever uh, with just K wires, it just kept um, ripping through their humeral head. And so what we did is placing the fibula in and getting the plate on, we're able to hold the reduction temporarily, use the plate assisted reduction, get it reduced and stabilized. And she ended up doing quite well. So even just with K-Wire, it's just not enough to get it and hold it in the right place. You can see here, this patient had been at home uh, for several days, uh, had fallen, wasn't able to get up and uh, the humeral head was cored out by the humeral shaft. You can see all this is missing. And so sometimes, you know, a, a uh, something that can hold that uh, together, whether it's metal or bone, is really what's necessary to get that uh, to heal properly, right? The real question is not, you know, whether or not we can get these to heal, but just because we can, you know, really should we? And if we look at the literature, I'm not so convinced sometimes, right? So this is a study out of Mayo that looked at uh, patients that are older, above the age of 60. This came out a couple of years ago. And what they found is the complication rate was up to 44%. And really, when you started looking at three and four part fractures, specifically in four part fractures, they had a 45% complication rate in patients above the age of 60. And the reoperation rate was quite high as well. Uh, we have several uh, um, RCTs that look at, at um, reverse versus plating in older patients. So here's one that came out in 2020. No difference um, for, for outcome. Better range of motion in healed ORF, but much higher complication rate and much uh, higher revision rate. When we look at other studies that looked at this as well, these are all in geriatric patients, whether it's ORF versus uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty or versus hemiarthroplasty in three-way studies. All of them tend to find that there's a much higher reoperation rate uh, for the um, arthro hemiarthroplasty or the ORF and much higher rate of complications. This is a very well done uh, RCT that was um, uh, uh, that looked at two-year outcomes. And basically what they found is the RSA gave better function. And this is more true in four-part uh, versus three-part fractures. Uh, and the RSA had less complications, even with the supposed high uh, risk of complications. Uh, here's a newer study that came out uh, this year, uh, or last year, sorry, in CORE, uh, that looked at this uh, same, same results, same function, uh, better function with RSA, uh, decreased revision rate, and decreased reoperation. So there's a theme, right, to all of these. So now when I look at this and I look at the data, I look at the thickness of the head, the four-part fracture, the dislocation, and the 64-year-old, I start thinking, well, maybe this patient needs uh, arthroplasty. And so for this patient, you know, I ended, uh, I shouldn't have went arthroplasty. I repair the tuberosities every time. The literature is very consistent on that, that uh, creating better outcome. You can see here, it's very stable. Um, I get them moving early. I think that's very important. And so she uh, ended up falling. This is not the same patient, um, but you can see here after a few, a uh, few months, the fractures are healed, tuberosities healed, and they can get a uh, high level of function, right? The forward elevation at, two, at three months being 125 for a seven-year-old is really quite good. And they actually tend to continue to get good uh, up to about the year mark. So if we look at my treatment algorithm for these now is, is for two parts in younger patients 
Uh, they're typically non-op or, or they get ORF. In older patients, they're mostly non-op, except for those like Hobie talked about that are completely displaced with more than 100%. And then in the three, four part fractures and fracture dislocations, those that have a high risk of failure, I'm typically fixing them when they're under the age of 60. And I start to think about reverse shoulder arthroplasty in the older patients, not to say that these cannot get uh, repaired. And I think that uh, when you have good reduction and, and good bone quality, um, th that can be a very good option, but I start to think about it much more. And this is sort of where we're at, at these, day, uh, these days with the literature. Thanks. So current evidence. Um, I want to talk about, um, well, well, number one, understand the literature is full of conflicting evidence. So there's a lot of conflicting articles that uh, are conf completely opposite of one another. Um, so you have to kind of look at the evidence and figure out how to apply what's in the literature to your practice. So I tried to pick out some articles that will help make you think about these fractures and figure out how you're going to apply some of the literature out there that's to your practice. Cause you're the one that has to decide what you're gonna do with these patients by yourself. And I'm gonna leave arthroplasty out because Jonah's the master of that. I'm just gonna talk about fixing versus not fixing. So when I read a lot of these papers, I always think to myself, does reduction in alignment matter in proximal humerus fractures? And to me, it absolutely does. And I think that that's been shown in the literature that your reduction in alignment does matter. So does the article that I'm reading uh, include the quality of reduction? Is that an important part of the article when they're talking about failures or they're talking about operative does the same as non-operative? Well, what are their, what's their alignment? What, like, do we have any reduction parameters at all? Otherwise, it's hard for me to understand what I'm looking at. So this article has been shown earlier and it talks about quality of reduction influences outcome after locked plating. And I think, I don't know, maybe all three of us have had this up there at this point. Um, but what I take away from this particular article, so they only had 98 patients, but they're all C-type fractures. They looked at their head shaft displacement, their head shaft angle and cranialization of the greater tuberosity kind of as the what they're looking at when they're looking at their reduction. So they, they define their reductions were either anatomic, acceptable, or malreduced. So they found that only 40% of them were anatomic or acceptable. So 60% were malreduced, okay? So a lot of people would look at this and say, well, this is not a very good study because they had all kinds of problems, they had all kinds of failures. But let's think about a couple of things. One, in their paper, a direct quote, they care, care was taken to position the plate at least five millimeters distal to the upper end of the greater tuberosity and two millimeters posterior to the bicipital groove. That is not where most of us try to position our plate. We're more focused on where our calcar screws are gonna be than where the top of the plate is. And they didn't really use augmentation in this paper either. So if only 40% of them were anatomic or acceptable, they had a 33% complication rate, over 25% revision rate, but they only had a 20% complication rate when they had an acceptable reduction and 41% when they did not have an acceptable reduction. So their outcomes were significantly better when they had a better reduction, knowing that their fixation and their augmentation were, were less than perfect. So to me, what this paper shows is that one, yeah, it's hard to get a really good reduction, but even when they don't use augmentation and they don't have a great perhaps fixation montage that we would use now, they still did a lot better when their patients were anatomically or acceptably reduced. So intact medial hinge had better outcomes, better coronal plane reduction had better outcomes, and they had better functional outcomes as well when they had an anatomic reduction. They did not evaluate the reduction in the sagittal plane. And of course they didn't maximize their function. So to me, that's why that paper is valuable. This is a paper that I tried to write up to try to uh, talk about uh, the reduction in the sagittal plane and kind of look at my own experience when I first got started. So basically it's retrospective. It's a single surgeon experience with ORIF. And we had essentially 41 three and four part fractures that we looked at. There were you know, some high energy injuries, some low energy injuries, a wide scattering of age from young to very elderly. 
Um, and this is like kind of at the beginning of my practice. We didn't have as good a follow-up as I wanted, but there were some things to take out of this paper that I, I want to stress upon you because I'm going to kind of add to what Jonah was saying about the sagittal plane. So we looked at our coronal plane reduction, our sagittal plane reduction. Was there a medial hinge or bony contact on the medial side? And what was the role of the initial displacement? So the greater the coronal initial displacement, we had more complications. And when we had coronal and sagittal head shaft angle, when we looked at that, it improved with experience. So my first two dozen cases were pretty tragic. I didn't do very well. These are hard fractures to fix. And there is a pretty steep learning curve, I think. After that, it gets a lot better and you get a lot better at looking at your x-rays, understanding when it's reduced, restoring that medial calcar. It gets better with time. So for the fellows that are watching this, don't be frustrated when you get out there. It takes a while to get better at this. And that's kind of what we were looking at. So lack of a medial hinge and a poor uh, head shaft angle re resulted in more complications. And we've seen that with others, with other uh, uh, situations. Now, that's in the sagittal plane. In the coronal plane, I was pretty good. So we didn't have enough variability to show a difference. But what I really want to get to is back to this picture. So Jonah was saying that the normal retroversion is around 20 to 25 degrees. And we kind of found that the sweet spot is indeed reducing this back to within 20 to 25 degrees of a normal retroversion. When you make it too straight or you don't correct it enough, you have more complications, more hardware failures. So if you take the time to kind of get this image burned into your head that there is a little bit of retroversion to the head when you're looking at that axillary view, I think this reduction as well as your coronal plane reduction are both very important. You have to correct that apex anterior. You have to give them the right amount of retroversion. So complications and long-term outcomes. Uh, this is another paper that's been put up, but I just want to pick it apart a little bit. They had 368 patients with displaced fractures, and they had at least two years of follow-up. These are complex fractures. Three-fourths of them had tuberosity involvement. Half of them had complete head shaft disengagement. 44% of them had a dislocated head. So stiffness, they listed as a complication. And I think a lot of, of, of proximal humerus fractures, you know, battle with stiffness for quite a while, but they had two-year follow-up. They only had 7% fixation failure or non-union. That's like better than most pub papers in the literature. Four had late osteonecrosis or post-traumatic arthritis. So if you look at their survivorship for any reoperation, it was three out of four at 10 years. If you get rid of stiffness, it was 90% at 10 years. So this is actually pretty good. This is a shoulder specialist clinic. These people treat proximal humerus fractures with some frequency. They're good at it. They know how to do it. And they actually have pretty good results fixing these fractures. So the results short-term and long-term functional outcomes were good with a relatively low complication rate, but they have a specialized service that treats these fractures, meaning they have people that do these a lot. They know how to do this. And I think it contradicts other articles claiming that operative is essentially equivalent to non-operative care. So to me, it's an important paper. And they, they say the support um, primary ORIF and medically fit patients with severely displaced fractures if you have the expertise to carry out such treatment. Let's look at locking plate with or without a strut support for various uh, displaced proximal humerus fractures in elderly patients. I think this is a good paper out of China. They had three groups. They had an intramedullary graft group. So they put the, the intramedullary um, uh, allograft straight down the canal. They had the medial hinge that we talked about. That was Mike's example that I showed and locking plate only. They're all various fracture patterns. They're all what we would consider elderly, I guess, 65 years old. They're four-part fractures. These are complex fractures in 128 patients. And they found that, or they looked at final varus angulation, the occurrence of major complications, and their ASES score at a year. Groups A and B. So if they put a fibula in there, whether it was vertical or if it was in the uh, medial calcar kind of supporting position, they had better scores, less final varus position, and fewer complications. So they found that the use of a fibular allograft was beneficial in this group of, of patients. There are some other papers that would say that 
you know, the fibular strut allograft really had no, uh, uh, out, no change in their functional outcome. It really didn't change anything at all versus plating alone. I think this is a pr pretty good paper that's done well. Um, that, that does demonstrate that the fibula can be helpful in these various fracture patterns. This one I wanted to include because it's a relatively recent paper. There's been some discussion about whether or not placing sutures in the cuff really neutralizes the deforming forces um, uh, in the proximal humerus. So this is an osteoporotic proximal humerus fracture model. It's a two-part fracture. They essentially create like a one centimeter gap and they have cadaveric specimens. And they did four scenarios, plate only. Now in all of those scenarios, the plate has only three screws in the head and they're all over drilled to try to simulate an osteoporotic situation. And then they did the plate with, you know, supraspinatus only, supraspinatus and subscap, supraspinatus, subscap, and infraspinatus and looked at their, their difference. So there wasn't a significant difference between the suture constructs, although as you add suture, it actually gets a little bit stronger, but not statistically. Supraspinatus alone was very good. It significantly reduced varus collapse compared to the plate alone in these fractures that are treated with a gap, which is essentially one that's prone to fall into varus. So suture augmentation, which I think the vast majority of us uh, talking today use, biomechanically seems like it, it, it's probably helpful. This one is the last one that I have. I think this one is an important paper to read because it talks about Prediction of non-union after non-operative treatment. So we treat a lot of these fractures non-operatively. Is there a way we can know ahead of time who is not gonna heal or who's gonna fail non-operative treatment? So they only looked at non-operatively treated patients and they looked at the prevalence and the risk factor for non-union and they tried to develop this FARIN, I think is how you pronounce it, proximal humerus fracture assessment of risk of a non-union model. So try to help us predict non-union. So they had a 10% non-union rate at a little over 2,200 patients. If you looked at them, about 1% of those that had a head shaft angle greater than 140, so those that are in valgus, if you're in valgus, only 1% of those developed a non-union. That's a pretty important piece of information, I think, to take home with you. And those that had less than 140, about 12% developed a non-union. As the, as the head shaft angle decreases and translation increases and smoking, all of those are independently predictive of non-union on their multivariate analysis. So in general, across the board, non-union was higher in smokers. If you look at those that had a head shaft translation, and head shaft angle. So head shaft translation less than 50% and their head shaft angle is greater than 90. Only 1% of those really developed a non-union. It's pretty low. So a little bit of valgus, not too much translation. The vast majority of those folks will heal pretty well. The more head shaft translation you have, the more varus you're in, look at this, look at the number, 84% developed a non-union. So if your head shaft angle is below 90 and they have significant translation, that's that's not a guaranteed, but pretty darn close to guaranteed non-union. So valgus and less than 50% of translation has a low non-union rate. Those are the patients you can safely treat non-operatively. Varus and greater than 50% has a very high non-union rate. Smokers across the board, higher. Thank you. That was awesome, Hobie. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I love, love going deep on the sagittal plane. I think that's been kind of under studied and uh, made some good data. The other interesting, just a couple comments. Other interesting thing, I love the, you know, Mike Robinson is just producing such, I think, valuable research. But one interesting thing on that first paper where you showed really good outcomes, like as good as any anywhere in the literature, 2000 pages. One of the things that struck me about that with their protocol is the, oh, the absolute number of patients they treated operatively with that protocol mm -hmm. was only like 10%. So, so the protocol is helpful with kind of quantifying, you know, mag, 
parameters to operate, but it actually is a very small percentage of patients. Just so I think it's good to keep in mind, you know, at a specialist center like that, they're not operating on many. The, and the, the, on the other paper, another interesting point they found of the non-operative treated patients, uh, um, they found psych the outcomes were very variable, actually. Some patients did well, some didn't. And it was, it was, heavily reliant upon a lot of psychological factors as well. Yep. So not yep. only is tuberosity displacement, things like this, but uh, but a lot of a lot of supertentorial issues. Yeah, I think it, even their psychosocial situation, like their their social situation, I think was part of that too. Like there's a lot of other extraneous factors other than just their fracture that that leads to a poor outcome for sure. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, some really thoughtful questions. Thank you all. I think a lot have been answered. We can revisit some of these, but maybe is one really good one, I think, on uh, the issue of nails. So maybe, Jonah, what's your take on the role of nailing of proximal humerus fractures? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, a nail is a tool, just like a plate. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. It's just, uh, you have to get the reduction. I think I'm not facile with nails. I don't use nails. I use plates. That's my, my, you know, sort of deformity, but I think uh, the nail doesn't reduce a lot of these fractures. Sometimes it helps in the two parts. If you have a perfect angulation, when you go in and then, you know, you're correcting for the apex in both planes, but you have to be really good. Just like the plate won't correct your fracture. I think you get the reduction and you nail and you know, these nails, the advantage is maybe there's a little bit less uh, dissection around the soft tissue, you know, to get the plate on, but um, to me, it's really just a tool. You have to get the reduction, and yeah, the newer nails have multiple points of fixation. They're quite, they're quite good in that sense. Yeah. So I'd add, you know, um, nails can clearly work. There's good data showing, uh, you know, it's a different technique, of course. And so if you know the nuances, um, the nail can be very successful. And the other thing, just briefly to the second part of that question, I don't, I don't nail many proximal humerus fractures, but I actually nail a fair number of diaphyseal humerus fractures. And so for the imaging, I'll bump the patient's torso and pelvis 20 or 30 degrees. And then unlike the positioning for proximal humerus RIF, we'll have the patient come, coming straight into the room and then the C-arm comes across the table and then it sees back for a gracie and sees over the top for a scapular Y and, mm -hmm. and it works very well for a nail. It's harder to see that sagittal plane for a proximal fracture using a, a Y view. But anyway, that's how I've kind of done the positioning. You know, Mike, it, it really makes sense that for a fracture that wants to fall into varus, a nail would be a good option, right? I mean, totally. but that's what we use them for, the femur, these varus prone proximal femur fractures. Boy, you want to get that thing reduced and a nail is going to be much better than a plate right but in the proximal humerus it's uh like jonah says it's a totally different technique it's a little foreign i think to a lot of us but biomechanically it seems to make sense that if you want to prevent various collapse a nail would be helpful totally yeah uh great well, we're coming right up on time. Uh, thanks so much to Hobie and Jonah for uh, joining tonight. I hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you found some valuable pearls in here. It was a little rapid fire, but thanks for your engagement, your questions, and uh, hope to see you again soon. And thanks Mackenzie and Abby from the AO for setting this all up.